What's going on YouTube? It's Tej back again with another video and today I'm giving you my way too early 2025 NFL mock draft. Just going over one round, which you know, coming off the heels of the 2024 draft feels good to kind of simplify things. Talk about 32 picks. We'll talk about a few more names than just the 32 in the mock cuz spoiler alert, I only have two QBs going. Um, this QB class definitely in my eyes takes a step down from last year, but I'm still optimistic it's not going to be a total dumpster fire. So I want to talk about some of the names uh, who my you know kind of who I'm thinking my QB three is. I haven't done a deep dive analysis. Give me give me another month before I start watching tape again, please and thank you. But nevertheless, I didn't make the draft order, so please don't yell at me. This is the PFF mock draft simulator. This is not my own doing. Saying the Panthers suck, the the Broncos are terrible. N none of that is me. This is just I think reverse Super Bowl odds. So um, yeah, uh, blame it, blame PFF, blame Vegas, not me. Um, and uh, I'm really just trying to give you, like, if you were to say, who are the first 32 names I should know about the NFL draft? Let's just make it top 36 names because I'll throw you know, a couple of extra quarterbacks in there. Who are those 36 names that I should be kind of thinking about throughout the offseason before we get into college football and then obviously the NFL season next year? And that's kind of what my point is. I'm not super worried about fits and, oh, we just drafted this and now you're doing it again. Like, I'm not really super worried about that. I, it played a little bit into each decision. But, again, I'm just trying to give you the – 35, 36-ish names uh, that I want you all to know about before we get into uh, the 2025 NFL draft cycle, man. And I also want to say thank you to everyone who supported, whether you just watch my videos regularly, hit the like button, subscribe, commented regularly on all my 2024 draft content. Best year for the channel so far, and I'm really hoping that 2025 will be able to say the same exact thing. Nevertheless, I have droned on long enough. We start things off with the Carolina Panthers. Taking edge rusher out of Tennessee, James Pierce Jr. Man, I think a really freaky athlete. I'm also going to do my best to try to just pop these up so you get an idea of like the size profile. But super twitchy athlete. Can win with length. Really, this is a guy that kind of wins off his his profile, just you know the kind of build and the athletic traits that he has. If this offseason, he's get co if he gets coached up, adds a couple moves to his repertoire, specifically like inside counters. Because you know, think about the conversation we had about Dallas Turner a year ago. Super explosive athlete, and he can win attack the outside shoulder with speed. But can he do something else? You know, Turner made some progress there. I think Pierce is, you know, almost another step up as an athlete. And then, uh, man, if he starts adding some, you know, uh, some counter moves, be able to move inside, add a little bit more beef to his profile, easily could be a guy that should go number one overall. And like real quick, like, uh, you know, the quarterback class isn't as good as compared to 2024. I almost feel like as as of my feelings right now, I have the right to change my mind as I watch more of these guys. This receiver class almost feels like it it starts kind of with the Brian Thomas, A.D. Mitchell, my receiver 4-5 last year. It almost feels, it's a good class, but it just kind of lacks three insane elite tier blue chipper prospects. Um, it's a it's a solid defensive tackle class that I'm really excited to talk about. I like the edge rushers a lot. Really, the defensive class is much better this year. So I'm not saying we're going to have 14 straight defensive players off the board next year, but uh, it's much, much more even when it comes to offense, defense, uh, talent distribution. If anything, maybe the defensive side, as I look at it right now, has the edge going into 2025. Anyways. Now we're going to actually have an offensive player go number two overall. It's going to be Will Campbell. Uh, man, uh, he, he's one of those guys that you watch some of these prospects from LSU and you just keep kind of gravitating back towards, who's that left tackle, you know? You know, who's that guy? Um, so Will Campbell, I mean, size, play strength, mobility, checks out, elite PFF grades. Um, so, yeah, definitely looks like a guy who could be a top five pick and potential OT1 off the board. We're going to talk about another offensive tackle here in the top five. Um, almost kind of the alt Fashanu conversation all over again with those two guys. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, talking about New England needs a, a book and left tackle. Uh, and I think it was Max Chadwick who was talking about this, but 60 to 1, Will Campbell to go number one overall. Look, especially considering the QB class isn't as good, and let's say that it kind of maintains that status. It's not crazy that a you know a tackle needy team sees Will Campbell as like an elite tier prospect if he doubles down on what he did this year. So that's kind of an interesting bet. Put down what 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 is that? Ten bucks to win seven hundred? Am I doing my math right there? Sixty to one? I don't know. Let me know. Uh, I'm not I'm not the best with that. But anyways, that could be a really interesting bet. You can kind of uh, just kind of save that money for later. Anyways, left tackle obviously need there for New England. Will Campbell stud. Uh, then we get to the Denver Broncos. I will go with Harold Perkins uh, here. He's a little bit lower on the um, the PFF board here, which is kind of interesting. And I mean, I'll admit, like he's, he's you're gonna hear comps out the wazoo about Micah Parsons. But you know, six one two twenty. You almost look at him as an off ball linebacker. But freaky athlete, and he's one of those guys that like, you go back to that Alabama game, his true freshman, and immediately you're like, who's that guy? You know, like, who's that dude? And, like, the fact that he played that well at, you know, 18, his true freshman year is insane. Uh, and he's super explosive. I think he'd be an insane pass rush threat. It just comes down to what his position's going to be. Can he be this hybrid guy? 
I mean, you look at Micah, Micah Parsons, started out as a hybrid, but now he's, he's just an edge rusher, and he's one of the best in the game. Perkins, I mean, they're going to have to add some weight, add some you know functional strength if he wants to do that full-time. So I don't know. Really, he's kind of one of those tweeners that's hard to figure out, but he's just such a good athlete that I just kind of, I'm just i just kind of looking at him like, put that guy on my field. Like, we'll figure it out. We, we need our 11 best athletes on the field. He's one of them. We'll figure out the position, you know, later. Um, and, and, you know, Denver, I think they could, one, they could use an upgraded off-ball linebacker. Definitely a spot they could get better. I know they drafted Jonah Ellis this year. They could use more pass rush juice in general. So, I mean, you'd have to get really creative how you're going to use Perkins. I almost think, like, off-ball linebacker could be, like, a Flores type, a Gerard Mayo in New England, that type of dude where they like to blitz linebackers. They get creative with that. Could that be the fit? I don't know. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what he, you know, height, weight, what LSU has Matt this year because that's going to kind of determine the direction. Does he stay at 6'1", 220? Has he bulked up? I'm really interested to see what the plan is for LSU, but also like what Harold Perkins wants to do uh, before he gets to the NFL. Next up, Tennessee Titans. I'm going to go with uh, Kelvin Banks. This is our other offensive tackle to talk about. J.C. Latham. I mean, I, I, I get the plan is to, uh, maybe to play him at left tackle, but we don't know that yet. I, I don't know that yet for sure. Um, I'd almost be more interested in keeping Latham at right tackle and seeing if Peter Skronsky could just play left tackle. But um, let's just say there's a world where Latham just plays right tackle. They figure out left tackle for a year, whatever. Kelvin Banks, this is your top end pass protector. So again, it's kind of the old Fashanu conversation with Campbell, Banks. You know, top tier pass protector with Banks versus the all around guy in Campbell. Uh, I tend to lean towards the all around guys. Uh, Alt was my OT one the entire cycle, so um, big fan of him, uh, obviously. But I'm also super excited to see what Kelvin Banks looks like this year. He's done a great job to kind of minimize, you know, blindside pressure against Queen Ewers. Has a great frame, great footwork as well. PFF grades to back it up as well, and a young guy too going into his junior year. So. A retro sophomore year, I think. Um, but nevertheless, a uh, ton of upsides. And if he can have another high-end pass protection year, he's going to be kind of in that Olu Fashanu range, right? Like somewhere in the top 11 picks. Uh, so definitely a big year. Uh, and Texas, a big year for Texas in general, like specifically Quinn Ewers, who we'll talk about later on. Here at uh, pick number five, I'm going to have Shadir Sanders be the first quarterback off the board. I think as of right now, I mean, I like Carson Beck. Like it's, Beck and Sanders are kind of why I'm like, it's not as bad of a class. It's just like, if those are your top two, it's definitely not the same as Caleb, Caleb and Drake, you know. Um, but that being said, I, I like these guys a ton. And, I mean, I know the whole conversation is going to be like, where will Dion let Shadir, you know, play? And also like Shadir, bro, we can see your tweets. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> if you want to look like a guy who can lead a locker room, maybe don't just start <laughs> throwing dudes under the bus and calling them mid. Just from just from my perspective, that might be my advice. But who, what do I know? You know. Um, but nevertheless, I, look, I, I don't think the Dion stuff, the whole like, oh, he's only going to play for the. I don't really think that's going to be a huge deal. And also, like, even if it is, to be the savior of the New York Giants, uh, like to be the the next great giant quarterback, the first one since Eli Manning, a guy who won two Super Bowls. Like, it's a huge media market. That's good for the Sanders brand too. Like, I, I don't know. I don't think New York would be a place that he would object to, other than the fact of like. If Brian Dable's there, maybe he doesn't like what Dable's doing. That being said, if the Giants are picking top five, I kind of have a hard time thinking that Brian Dable's there. As much as I like Dable, and I hope they're not picking here, if they are, it's kind of hard to imagine that him and Shane are still there. So um, I'm hoping that they are because I like those guys. But nevertheless, this could be like new quarterback, new regime, kind of new start all over again with the Giants if they're picking this high. But nevertheless, I, I think right now I like Sanders the best of this quarterback class. Again, haven't done my full deep dive. I'm just kind of going off what I saw last year when I watched other dudes on tape like noticing, you know, you know, should your Sanders, your Calvin Bank, all these guys, you know. Anyways, let's get on to the uh, Washington Commanders. This is a secondary that needs, needs some improvement. And yeah, Will Johnson, I'll be honest, like Will Johnson might have been cornerback one uh, for me last year. And uh, and I prioritize slot over outside corner, which like I'm, I, I think I might be the only person who's kind of lobbying for that. But that's fine. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a lonely island being correct. Uh, but nevertheless, like Will Johnson still might have been CB1, just like size, speed, freak, just like so technically polished. I mean, I think it was Jordan Reed who kind of tweeted like shades of Patrick Sertan. And like, you look at how polished he is, like totally checks out. Like I could totally see that comp, kind of comparable size and athleticism too. I think he might actually be a little bit of a better athlete than Sertan. But yeah, love me some Will Johnson. I think this would give Washington a clear cut outside corner number one. Epic number seven. Hey, the Arizona Cardinals did draft a wide receiver in the first round, but Luther Burton's a very different receiver than Marvin Harrison Jr., a big threat guy, field stretcher. And I think adding that type of field stretching, big playability on top of what you're going to ask Marvin Harrison to do, and that's going to be an assassin in the 10 to 20 yard range. You can do a lot of things, but, you know, lean on his route running, lean on his size, lean on him being like a, a possession plus, and, you know, 
when QB play was good at Ohio State, the man was a merchant. He was an absolute killer in the 10 to 20 yard range. So let him do that. Let Luther Burden, you know, push safeties further down the field, open it up for Marvin Harrison Jr. That would be a gnarly one two punch in Arizona. Here at pick eight, I'm going to give the Minnesota Vikings Mason Graham. Um, you know, like considering they did pick, t- you know, did keep pick 23, I was like really holding out hope. Maybe Byron Murphy will fall to them. No, that didn't happen. Maybe Johnny Newton's their guy. Said they get Dallas Turner, but like, Mason Graham would be one hell of an interior uh, defensive line upgrade for this team. And like Mason Graham is like, he's such an interesting guy to watch because all last year for Michigan, I was like, man, like that dude's a stud, but like there's no way 285, 290 pounds going to play at the next level. And yeah, you see he's 318. And even if like Michigan's boosting that a little bit, he's probably 305, 310, but he just moves so well that like he hides his size. So I was shocked to see that he weighed this much. And even if this is an exaggeration, let's say he's 308. Let's say they're boosting by, you know, 10 pounds. 6'3", you know, 308 when, look, Byron Murphy, official weight is sub 300. I think he'll play at 305. I'm talking about a guy with comparable, you know, weight, a little bit taller. I think the arm length is going to be a, a big plus in his department too. And like just carries that weight move. So explosive. Yeah, Mason Graham, what an absolute stun and like tore it up in the college football playoffs. So big time tape and, you know, big time games. Big fan of Mason Graham, and I think right now, like, I don't want to call anybody a lock for the top 10, but, like, I have a hard time imagining that type of that type of athlete with that size doesn't go somewhere in the top 10. Next up, Las Vegas Raiders. This is where Carson Beck's going to come off the board. You can easily flip Beck and Sanders. Like, if Dayball's there, like, I could see where he looks at the tools of Beck and is like, yeah, that's my guy. But, you know, I just think right now I like Shadir a little bit more. Uh, but I like Carson Beck. And really what impressed me the most is, like, as the year goes on and Georgia gets more more banged up, Ladd McConkey starts battling a ton of injuries. Brock Bowers starts to get banged up, especially in that like last game against Bama. Like Brock Bowers was played at fifty percent, and Ladd McConkey same thing. Like every time they made a play, they had to go to the sideline because they were like banged up. But like the three games right before that against Bama, dude, like those guys were playing at less than one hundred percent, and Carson Beck was playing better. Like he elevated the offense, and like that that to me is like a signal. Like there might be something here. Like elite quarterbacks elevate what's around them. And, and like, even if you have a great supporting cast, like that, that will, that would go a long way to propping yourself up. But as we saw the kind of situation get a little bit more muddy there at Georgia, because Bowers and McConkie were banged up, I thought Beck played better. And then obviously the Bama game happens, but like Bama secondary was probably the second best in the country right there with Michigan, right? Like Sarah still still Johnston or Johnson and, um, and, uh, the other Michigan corner whose name's of course now escaping me, but like. Bama was right there with them. So that was that was a tough, <laughs> a tough defense to face when those two guys are not 100%. I think up until that point, he really showed that, hey, I can be the guy who elevates everything around me. Prototypical size, nice arm strength, clean throwing motion, very accurate pass. You see the PFF grade is nice as well. So yeah, I like Carson Beck. And I think he'd be a really solid prospect worthy of a top 10 pick. Like this year's gonna be huge because obviously no Bowers, no McConkie. We'll get to see what it's all about. But I think Carson Beck's in for a good year. I've said that before about Georgia quarterbacks though. So we'll see. Uh, let's get on the C. Seattle Seahawks here, uh, pick 10. I don't know if Malachi Starks goes this high, but I like Malachi Starks, uh, a guy who's played just about everywhere on the field. You see the height weight uh, in a good spot too, 6'1", 205, but then you also see the snap alignment, little slot, little box, little deep. I almost wonder with Tyke Smith, Javon Bullard, two guys that I, to me are both NFL slots, um, I almost wonder if Malachi Starks gets some more of that. And also like Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, they like to use those kind of overhang defenders as their star backers, and they're kind of the center of the defense. I'd be shocked if that's Malachi you know, Starks. Um, no, granted, I'm not following like Georgia preseason all that close just yet, but I'd be surprised if he's not that star backer and that overhang defender. That if so, dude's going to be making plays. He'll be a high-level run defender, has a ton of athleticism, a ton of range to where whether he's playing deep or in the box or and is playing in the slot, dude's going to have a, a ton of ball production too this year. So big fan of Malachi Stark. Maybe he doesn't go as high as 10, but to me, easily the top safety in the class as of right now. Uh, let me get to the uh, New Orleans Saints. I'm going to go Deion Walker. I mean, he, another one kind of like Mason Graham, but even more so like 340, 48 pounds, no shot, no shot. He actually looks like he might be like three, you know, 340 to 350, but he moves, he moves so well. So a true enigma kind of a, you know, I find I find ourselves talking about these planet theory guys. You know, there's Jordan Davis. Not too long after that, it's Devondre Sweat. And now we're talking about Deion Walker as a potential like planet theory. There's only one of these guys, so maybe they're they're really not one of one. But Deion Walker, 350, moving the way he does at six six with the arm length. I assume he has really special product. Really turned it on last year at Kentucky, and if he can double down on that, you know, and kind of go from 74 grade 80 to like low to mid 80s here, if not better. Yeah, he's going to go top half the first round just because, again, Planet Theory, someone's going to sell themselves on. Like, there's no one that big and moves that well. So, um, 
Yeah, that'd be a really interesting fit there, too, in like New Orleans. Him and Brian Brzee is like your interior tandem of the future. Be a lot of fun. Uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm going to go Travis Hunter here. I do see Travis Hunter as a cornerback who can play receiver. Shades of his coach, Deion Sanders. Uh, And honestly, like athleticism man coverage ability uh stays in phase with uh receivers like there's a lot of there's there's a little bit of Dion's game in there for sure and part of that's probably like the influence he gets from Dion. but uh that 2022 grade obviously not at the division one level or like fbs level i should say uh but then 2023 i think it was a better start to the year then he gets banged up the back half of the year is not as impressive maybe but um especially with colorado's hot start like we got to see what hunter was all about uh, again I, I think he's more of a corner than a receiver but I, I wouldn't be shocked if like one the punt the new kick return rules maybe that boosts his stock wouldn't be surprised and then also like yeah you just throw him in the mix as a receiver and like t- that's kind of what makes tampa bay an interesting spot they just draft this power slot they got their top three defined right so then when you're using travis hunter as like that receiver four kind of gadget dude I'm kind of here for that. Like I could, I can get on board with getting creative with him. Uh, it's going to come down to Liam Cohen and Co. If he's still there as the OC uh, to figure that out. But also, like this team needs another corner after the Carlton Davis trade. So yeah, I think this makes a ton of sense to project out a year in advance. Uh, Indianapolis Colts, easy spot. You know they didn't go Brock Bowers in the first round, so he, automatically I was like Colston Loveland. Here we go. Loveland's a stud. Uh, he, to me, I, I think Mitchell Evans has a shot to be another first round tight end. But if there's only going to be one, I think Colston Loveland is that guy. Six five, two forty five. He'll probably get that weight number up by the time we get to the combine too, like two fifty three to two fifty eight. You gotta give you idea of a, a you know prototypical inline uh, kind of tight end size. But I, I think he's a high-end blocker. I think he's a really nice receiver. Good yards after the catch ability. I'm a big fan of Colston Loveland. I think he could just do a little bit of everything. Um, I don't think anything near receiving-wise to the high end that like Brock Bowers does, but where people had some concerns about Bowers, his weight, his strength, his blocking ability. Colston Loveland, you don't question any of that. So in some ways, a little bit better of a prospect than Bowers, but I don't think he nearly has like the high-end receiving ability that uh, Bowers has. But not nevertheless, like... Not a bad receiver whatsoever. So you send him to the Indianapolis Colts, he'd be an upgrade over whoever they have, or you know their current wide tight end room, whatever it ends up looking like in a year's time. I would imagine Loveland is an upgrade over that, um, and also that type of blocker for Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson on those you know read option plays. Who sign me up for that? Uh, a pair of corners are going to come off the board here. Pittsburgh Steelers are going to take Benjamin Morrison. I'm a Notre Dame fan, and I'm also a Steelers fan, so. Call it is a little bias here for sure, but this would make me u- uber happy. Last time I saw the Steelers draft a Notre Dame player, it didn't work out great. Shout out Chase Claypool. Hopefully he does well in Buffalo. But prototypical size, good athlete. Um, he was the Notre Dame corner, interestingly enough, that was targeted more compared to Cam Hart. So it is interesting to see like teams want to attack Morrison more than Hart. Uh, and that's why I was like, dude, the fact that Hart fell to the fifth round is criminal. Shout out to the Chargers for snagging that value. Uh, but I do like Benjamin Morrison a ton. A guy that played really well uh, as a true freshman as well. So he's kind of got this pedigree. And if he can kind of build upon what he did as a freshman or and then as a sophomore you know definitely could be a guy that goes top half of the first round the next corner we're gonna have come off the board here is Denzel Burke uh, a guy that hey if he was in this year's class definitely could have been one of the guys in the first round mix last year was a huge year for Burke um, you know started as a true freshman in Ohio State they put him on the field right away and then last year was kind of the year where I was like can he take that next step forward and you know that he did you can see here um, did miss some time with some injuries during the middle of the season got a little banked up but ultimately still played 11 games so not too too bad whatsoever a majority of that was played on the outside which I also like and if he is truly 6'1 190 I'm not too concerned about the arm length if that you know correlates one to one with the uh, the height, um, but I think it's going to be an outside corner. I think last year more ball production we saw. Hey, this can be a number one corner, and that's kind of why I was like, oh, okay, this guy's gonna he's gonna go ahead and declare. Uh, but now going into either his retro junior year or his senior year, I think he's just a true senior. Um, that being said, this could be another year where if he can double down on it, top half of the first round guy for sure. I think it's just a natural the position, and we really saw that put on display last year. Jacksonville Jaguars here at 16. Maybe a little bit of a hot take, but I, I think Jack Sawyer is going to end up being the Ohio State edge that goes off the board first. Former five-star recruit. I remember when he first got to Ohio State, like his true freshman year, there were there were times where they would just use him as like a QB spy. And like that to me screams like, hey, he's one of our best athletes. We've got to have him on the field. We'll find out what he can do. Like we'll, we'll figure out something he can do. So he t- obviously he's developed more as an edge. Uh, started to really pick it up towards the end of the year last year, Ohio State. Um, so I think he's kind of developing that pass rush profile. He's getting better there. Super athletic, super really nice first step burst, speed to power because of that. And then also like a pretty strong dude, like well built. Um, and I think the play strength is is, is really solid for six four two sixty five. So um, yeah, that type of athleticism plus that power and at two sixty five. To me, uh, I think this is going to be the breakout year. I think he's going to. I think he's the edge rusher we're talking about 
at, at Ohio State kind of taking games over. Uh, Cleveland Browns are next at 17. I'm going to go Abdul Carter here. He's another one of these guys like, you know, what's his position going to end up being? Uh, obviously, PFF has him listed as a linebacker, and he's kind of, you know, 6'3", 250. You almost look at that, and you're like, no, that's edge. Like, that's an edge rusher for sure. Um, you know, especially when you look at, like, Harold Perkins, 6'1", 220. All of a sudden, Carter looks like a monster, <laughs> you know? So, um it's going to come down to what they ultimately think. I, this is weird. I don't. I don't know what this is all about. Uh, did, did, did not play. Uh, <laughs> did not play deep safety. Maybe he did, but um, kind of an interesting chart there. I don't know if PFF normally does that for linebackers. Anyways, I'm getting off on a random tangent here, but um, you know, six three two fifty. You know, does he kind of play this hybrid edge linebacker thing? And, and ultimately, if that is the case, does he eventually just become a full time edge? Six three two fifty. I feel a lot better about that than you know six one two twenty with Perkins. So another high end athlete. Uh, a lot of pass rush production to go with it. Uses an off ball linebacker and that spot so another guy that's going to kind of get a lot of those Micah Parsons comps and part of that's because of the school as well and you know I think a linebacking core that and uh Cleveland that could use another upgrade if he does decide to continue to play linebacker long term pick number 18 I'm gonna have Tyleek Williams be the pick here uh for the Chicago Bears still think they're looking for that true disruptive presence at that three tech spot which is pivotal for uh, Matt Eberflus's defense so I'm gonna go Tyleek Williams um there were some rumblings that maybe he could go into last year's class I think he was on my 2023 way too early honorable mentions into your defensive line rankings but um if not he was definitely a name i shouted out and considered because he was like just outside the top 10 uh but yeah big body guy got one of those another one of these monsters of a human being uh but uh, you know 62 90 but also that first step get off it's like yeah yeah, again not like 360 like deon walker but it's like dude guys at 290 should not move and be that explosive so uh gonna be a big year for him another highly titled recruit which i mean how many times do we say that about ohio state so the recruiting background the athletic profile and now with michael hall gone can tyler williams be the guy who takes games over for ohio state on the inside so it's gonna be really interesting to see how this pass rush production ohio state shakes out between tyler williams jack sawyer jt to amelo uh it's gonna be really interesting to see how that all kind of plays out who becomes the top dog i think it's gonna become sawyer but i also think williams could be a big part of that uh as well Next up, uh, the Chargers, and here we go. Uh, these Arizona guys got fun names. So, Tatero McMillan. Uh, that is pulled from the uh, Arizona pronunciation guide. So, if it's wrong, uh, don't yell at me. I just pulled it literally right from their uh, their game notes. Tatero, Tatero, uh McMillan. Uh, and he is the brother of uh, Jalen McMillan, who was just drafted. And 6'5", 205, great yards after the catch ability. I think he's going to be a combine warrior for sure, uh, especially considering he is 6'5", 205. So I think he's going to put up some really nice numbers. Big year this last year at uh, Arizona. It's going to be a fun Arizona team, too. Like, not the last Wildcat that we'll talk about here uh, in this video. Another guy with a really tricky name. Also, their quarterback is someone we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Smaller guy, but hashtag fun to watch and uh, really turn it on late during the season last year. And if he builds on that this year, he could be a guy that gets himself into the first round. But McMillan... I mean, that type of size speed, you know, into that receiver room with Ladd McConkey. Uh, yeah, I would be really excited about that long term for the Chargers. Uh, going back to the receiver well here for the Houston Texans, Stephon Diggs, it's a one year deal. So let's go get another pure route runner and a separator and a Mecca Egbuka. Um, definitely could have come out this year. I do think he's going to end up being slot only, if I'm honest. Uh, you know, weight's going to be a big part of this conversation. He's listed at 206, but uh, I'm not, I, 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 I doubt that. I seriously doubt that. Um, but also, like, we'll see where Ohio State ultimately ends up using him because memory serves. They've pretty much used him as a slot-only guy. Um, uh, yeah, for the most part last year uh, in, in slot and same thing with the year before. So um, if that continues to be the case, then, yeah, I feel I feel fine with him going to Houston as their slot wide receiver. I think Nico Collins, clearly an outside guy. I think Tank Dell more than showed that he's an outside guy last year. So I'd be fine with him being their slot, you know, guy and replacing Stephon Diggs, kind of sharp route running, that type of uh, – uh, ability in that wide receiver room so I would like that and uh, definitely a guy that could go round one he also would make a lot of sense to go to the Jets uh, but also Emeka Ibuka CJ Stroud that'd be a fun reunion for sure anyways pick 21 the New York Jets um, this is kind of a fun one for me um, I get a Notre, uh, Notre Dame fan here but let's say uh, this Javon Kinlaw like project doesn't work out he ends up not having like a another step forward this year and uh now the Jets are like, man, can we get one more guy next to Quinton Williams? Dude, like Howard Cross, little undersized for sure. Not the biggest defensive tackle, but super explosive. Has a full repertoire of moves. Good with his hands. Shades of Kalijah Kansi from a few years ago. And that's kind of like, I'm not saying he's one-to-one, -one, but kind of giving you shorthand, you know, kind of giving you a head start. I think Kalijah Kansi is a little different for sure, but I think that type of uh, defensive tackle. Putting him right next to Quinton Williams, who's a high-level run defender, big body guy, can keep Cross clean. But then you get to third and 10, and both those guys are rushing from the interior. Could be a ton of fun, uh, and there were some there were some people who were mocking the interior defensive line. Some fun ideas there to 
give Quinn and Williams that type of running mate. So why, why don't we talk about it here early on in 2025's draft class? Howard Cross would be a fun idea there at 21. Atlanta Falcons are up next. Takario Davis. I know he's still in the portal last time I checked, right? Like, I'm pretty sure he still is, but I'm uh, almost positive he's going to stay at uh, Arizona. It sounds like that's that's what's going to end up happening, but 6'4", need I say more? 6'4", and a good athlete? That's my type of corner right there. So Takario Davis is definitely someone I'm keeping a close eye on this year because like the upside of those those big athletic corners for me is like immense. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a big fan of his game and someone I'm keeping uh, keeping an eye on. 185 at 64, I'd like to see him bulk up a little bit more, but obviously once we get to the combine, he'll put on some water weight, so that number is probably gonna move. Let's get to the Miami Dolphins at 23. I'm gonna go with Evan Stewart here. Um, I don't think yeah they still have him as an AM receiver. He's transferred to Oregon, but a really sharp route runner, super explosive athlete. Um, not the biggest guy, but kind of in that almost new Devonta Smith, you know, kind of mold, six foot one seventy five, um, and again, super explosive out of his breaks. And now going to Oregon in this timing based offense, like. Tell me who couldn't be there, Troy Franklin, this year. And tell me Dylan Gabriel's not a perfect guy to run that system, get the ball out quick, utilize screens. Uh, and Evan Seward is the guy, yards after the catch threat. Well, I think he's a great fit for Oregon. I just need PFF to update where he's playing. I think him and Dylan Gabriel, they're going to have an insane season. They're going to put up some gaudy numbers this year. Uh, the Green Bay Packers at 24. I'm going to go Nick uh, Scorton. I think that's... this. I think that's how you uh, say his name, but I'm not entirely sure. But he's coming off a year with a 90 plus PFF grade um, and at 6'4, 260. Uh, I'm uh, in love with that. I was hoping they showed the pass rush grade. The PFF pass rush grade is up and over 90, which is elite. So, um, another Purdue edge rusher that we're talking about in the first round. I know that the Packers just drafted Lucas Van Ness a year ago. I'm not, this is not one where I'm like, this is the landing spot for him. He's got to go to Green Bay. Not Nothing like that. Um, it's just more so like I wanted to get this guy in the first round, and this was just, you know, the spot that kind of made sense. So not necessarily saying that like he's the Green Bay Packer guy, especially if they do want to play Van Ness on the outside. But if they want to move Van Ness inside, you know, I could see where they want to take a shot on Nick here, play him on the edge. But uh, just more so wanted to get him in the first round conversation. It's during the year he had last year at Purdue. If he puts up another year with elite pass rush production um, and another 90-plus PFF pass rush grade, figure on him being a first rounder next year. Dallas Cowboys next up at 25. Uh, my top running back in this class. Like I, I like, I like Ollie Gordon. Um, and I like Trayvon Henderson. He's actually from Virginia too. So I'm a little biased against him, but number one overall recruit uh, coming out of the state of Virginia, his recruiting class. But to me, I think Amari and Hampton is the best running back in this class. And as much as I love Javante Williams, Hampton might be better. Like, I don't know. Like this is going to be a big year to kind of prove that for me. Like, is he actually better than Javante Williams was last year? Just an insane year. But Big playability, super shifty, uh, and six foot two twenty. Honestly, like five nine two twenty is kind of my ideal size, but six foot's not too big to where I worry about that. But uh, it's the ability to win in a phone booth, win in a sprint, you know, uh, but also a little bit of power there. Two twenty goes a long way, so kind of a jack of all trades. Also, think a solid pass catcher. So yeah, big fan of Amari and Hampton, and uh, I think you know. Once Dallas didn't draft a running back, I was like, boom, that's where the, that's where the running back's going to my 2025 way too early mock. So this one was too easy for me. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles. This is where I'm going to have JT Tuamelo go off the board or Tuamelo out. I've heard it both, but uh, I'll go with Tuamelo out there. So uh, and I think that's I think that's kind of one I'm gravitating towards. But Tuamelo out is like that Brandon Graham replacement, you know, straight line power rusher. I think that makes a ton of sense. Brandon Graham cannot just keep playing one year after another on these one-year contracts. Eventually, he's going to hang it up. And Tuamelo out definitely could... To me, he makes a lot of sense as that, you know, high motor power rusher replacement for Brandon Graham. Um, he's just a guy that he's got to be more consistent. Like some games, he looks like an absolute game wrecker. And then some games you're like, is he playing? So he just needs to find that consistency, find another gear. Um, five-star recruit, one of the highest, you know, rated recruits in 247 history. And, you know, sometimes like, you know, office tackles in the NFL, like we talk about a year three leap, you know, maybe to him, oh, wow. Like maybe it's just, you know, he needs one more year. And this can be the year where that flip switches and, he puts it all together and he gains that new mentality and he's just going to become an absolute force and a game wrecker week in and week out. And if that's the case, move this guy up about 20 spots, you know, or somewhere there about, right? Like he's going to be a top 10 pick, but to this point, we just haven't seen that consistency out of him. Detroit Lions are next up and I'm going to go with Trey Harris here. Another guy that like could be a really sneaky guy to kind of dominate in the SEC. This Ole Miss team is just, the, the chips are in the center of the table. Like they are using the portal to the best of their advantages. 6'2", 205, great field stretching ability. The tough part about Ole Miss, and we'll talk about Jackson Dart, like it's not a very NFL translatable offense. Lane Kiffin's kind of in his own world doing his own thing. It's super effective for college and it leads to a ton of box score production. But it's going to come down to sometimes that route tree. Like I feel like the like Deami Brown, perfect example. I 
you see the size and you see the athleticism and you're like, how, why are NFL teams passing on him? Why is he falling all the way into like the mid third? But it's because like the route tree at North Carolina doesn't really always translate. He's mostly just a deep threat. And like I could see where we get to the NFL draft and NFL teams are viewing him mostly as just a guy that runs eight, eight and nines. And if that's the case, then he's not going to go in the first round. But if NFL teams see the ability, see the athleticism and say, he can already do that. Now we just got to add a little bit more on top of that. We can coach him up then I definitely think he's got a shot to go in the first round. It goes 6'2", 205, his long speed. Yeah, that doesn't come around, but so often. Uh, then we get to Cincinnati Bengals here at 28. Uh, this is a, this is a little bit of a projection pick, but I'm going to go Michael Williams. Yes, they do have him here in the edge. He is a defensive interior guy for Georgia that's now moving full-time to edge. So I'm really interested to see what this experiment brings about. 6'5", 265, kind of... Honestly, ideal edge rusher size. Uh, another five star recruit too. So like high end, you know, athletic traits and you know, highly uh, decorated, you know, high school prospect that tends to go a long way. Uh, see these guys earlier on in their college career and kind of gives you a little bit of a head start on maybe what guys could be in these first rounds of these way too early mocks. Uh, but with him moving full time to edge, I think that athleticism will play a little bit more. I think two sixty five. That's about the right uh, right frame for a guy at six five. So I mean, this is a true projection pick because I haven't seen him play edge whatsoever, pretty much. Uh, but given the recruiting profile, given the fact that Georgia now is like, hey, let's move you to the edge. Like, this is your turn. That makes you really, really interested. Uh, Georgia, like Alabama, though, they don't let their edge rushers get really wide of the tackles. So they're mostly kind of like four eyes, and they're kind of head over the tackles. So that kind of sucks. And again, we'll see what type of edge rusher Mikel Williams is. Like, But if he's... You know, if he's like Dallas Turner, that's a guy I want to see super wide of the tackle because he wins with speed and athleticism. And like Will Anderson, you see him get to play wide of the tackle and, oh my God, his rookie gets double-digit sacks. Like, oh no shit. Uh, so uh, we'll see. We'll see. Because I mean, that was something that people talked about a ton with Trayvon Walker. Like, oh, well, the athleticism would have showed more if he got to move outside wide of the tackle. Maybe, but you know, I haven't seen him in the NFL level yet, but that's not the, that's not today's discussion. Uh, Jags fans don't come for me. Uh, so Michael Williams could be really interested to see what this year has in store for him. Um, then we get to the Buffalo Bills. Uh, another, another Notre Dame uh, player in the mix here, uh, Xavier Watts. Coming off an All-American season, I think he could play some free. I think he could play some strong. 5'11", 204. It's not the tallest guy, but I think the 204 plays. Um, you can see a pretty even mix between box and slot. Also a guy who could play in the, in the nickel. Maybe Notre Dame does more of that this year. Um, I don't think the Bills would draft him for that need because Teron Johnson's a rock solid guy. And I know they just drafted Cole Bishop in the second round. So this is not necessarily me saying like, oh, the Bills still got to invest in safety. We'll see. Let me see what it looks like this year with Cole Bishop and then we'll figure it out. But I think Xavier Watts, like I think this could be a year where we see two safeties um, go in the first round, uh, which is crazy considering what Newbin first safety off the board at 47. Uh, so unless you wouldn't call DeGene a safety at 41. But either way, you know, the 40s, it was where we get the first safety this year we might. Might sneak in two safeties in the first round, but I really like Xavier Watts playmaking ability, a ton of, you know, middle of the field production against USC. That's kind of, I felt like a name, I felt like a game where all of a sudden people start talking about Xavier Watts more and it's like, he's just been pretty good for Notre Dame for a while now. Like I really like him a ton. And again, coming off an all American season, really like him as an over the top free safety guy, but I think he's got flexibility to be able to do a little bit of both. Baltimore Ravens are next up at 30 and bring on the names, man. I I, I learned this dude's name because I was like, there's no way he's going back to school. And it sounded like he might uh, transfer to Ole Miss too. So Princely Uman Nielen, uh, I had to double check where he's actually playing. So I, I don't, I should have done that before we recorded, but Princely was a guy that again, I, Kind of shocked that he didn't declare because, like, I look at the size and the athleticism, and I'm like, dude, like, that's that's a guy who can kind of flirt with the first round, maybe you know, late first, kind of early second range. Um, maybe you can add another five, ten pounds, eh, maybe 10, 15 pounds worth of muscle. Like, if you tell me he's six five, two sixty five, like uh, Malik Williams, then I'm like, all right, cool, like that, that's that's perfect. Uh, or Mikel Williams, sorry, um, been perfect. But you know, if he's really six five, two fifty five, I think that can work. Super explosive, get off, um, and also arm like that plays too. And he's coming off a really productive of the year uh, this last season uh, with with Florida. So uh, you know, the PFF grade went down, but a little bit more stacks, more hits. Hurry's almost uh, almost doubled there. So if he has another year like that in the SEC, takes another step forward, you see the numbers go up, uh, adds a little bit more muscle to his frame. We feel like his hand placement gets a little bit better, can uh, win more with his hands, add, uh, add one to two more moves. Then, yeah, like definitely a guy that I think should go in the first round. There's, there's a couple of good edge rushers. They really, it's like... The tough part about doing this is like there's a lot of guys that I could see being first rounders. It's just going to come down to are they going to live up to what I think could make them first rounders. We'll find out. But I'm a big princely Uman Mielin guy. And also I learned how to say the name. So Uman Mielin had to get him in here. Uh, San Francisco 49ers here at 31. Bring on the names. We're going to go with Arizona's right tackle. And it does sound like he's going to continue to play right tackle this year. We're going to go with Jonah 
Seven Naya, Seven Naya. Uh, so I uh, should have said it with more confidence. I had that one, Seven Naya. Uh, but coming off a really strong year at uh, Arizona, and actually played a little bit of guard too last year, and then started out at Arizona as a right guard. But high end athletic traits, I think, has a frame that fits at right tackle, and also Colton McKivitz on a one year deal there in San Francisco. So I think the movement skills match with what Shanahan wants to do. It's obviously a position of need for San Francisco, kind of a you know area fit to Arizona to San Francisco, not too much of a, a moving cost there. So uh, Seven Naya. Yeah, I like that a ton there for the 49ers. Before I give you the Kansas City Chiefs picks, let's talk about some of these other guys. Starting with the quarterbacks, Quinn Ewers, uh, just going to need to see more consistency. You know, when he plays Alabama, he looks like a bona fide first round pick. Uh, and then in garbage time in the college football playoff last year, looks like a stud and almost leads Texas on that comeback. But ultimately, man, it's just it, we need to see it week in and week out uh, from Quinn Ewers. It's not enough to see a flash in the pan. And I'm hoping this year that, you know, Arch Manning, hell of a spring game for him. Maybe that's enough to kind of bring out another edge in Quinn Ewers. And ultimately, I feel like that's going to give us our answer. Sometimes when there's that heat on your ass, like, you know, got that guy, that backup pushing you. Sometimes, sometimes guys falter and, uh, you know, they kind of crumble under the pressure. I mean, I'm not going to say that Spencer Rattler, but like just using that as an example, I think the pressure kind of got to Rattler at OU. Caleb Williams steps in and then obviously like Williams, number one overall pick. Like I'm not saying uh, Arch Manning definitely could be that in some time, but um, you know, sometimes that happens. And I think Rattler bounced back again. I'm not trying to slander Rattler. Had him in the top 60 of my big board. So I like Rattler. I'm optimistic to see what happens in New Orleans. Or you have a guy that, like, oh, that dude's on my ass. All right, well, that's, I just got to work that much harder. And if that's the case, then it's like, okay, Quinn Ewers, this could be his breakout year. But that being said, you look at Xavier Worthy breaks a combine record. Adnai Mitchell, yeah, he falls, but 6'4", 4 three, five speed. JT Sanders, uh, a top 50 pick at running back. It's like, dude, brother, like, that was your year. That was your year to break out. You had all the talent around you. They do have Isaiah Bond coming in, so we're, we're going to talk about him in actually one pick. So... Optimistic about Ewers, but we just got to see that consistency. Jalen Milrow, I think a better athlete, but we started to see him make some progress as a passer. And, you know, with one more offseason with the right QB coach, we could see him make some serious strides in the right direction. Drew Aller feels like the guy that everyone's talking about the upside. I'm just not there. Last year at Penn State was too rough for me. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Dylan Gabriel to me is much more like, I think his stats are going to be insane. But uh, I just don't think NFL caliber arm. Really right now, I think Riley Leonard's my quarterback three. Uh, I thought he was a guy that could have put himself in the, the late first kind of second round discussion if he did declare last year. Instead, he transferred just transferred to Notre Dame. So again, my Notre Dame bias coming in here for sure. But great athlete, great size. I like the arm strength. If we can even out that accuracy, then like with a sporting cast and if Notre Dame's receiver play gets a little bit better this year, definitely could be a guy that moves himself in that, you know, QB three first round conversation. Jackson Dart, another guy I want to talk about. Um, going to be a big year for him. Like Ole Miss, again, chips were in the center of the table. So it could be the year where if Ole Miss is really, really good, a lot of that could be Jackson Dart. And because of that, he might get a lot of prime time games, get an opportunity to shine in the spotlight. Another guy just needs to be more consistent. You know, I think the bowl game last year was a really strong note to kind of end his year. So there's some optimism going into the season. And then Noah, uh, Noah Fafita, uh, small guy. Uh, that, that's kind of be the knock against him. If you make him 6'3 and 235, uh, he's in this first round knock for sure. But a nice playmaker. And again, a guy that really started to pick it up towards the end of last year for Arizona. And all of a sudden, the weapons start to really uh, pop there in uh, Arizona's offense. So those are some of the quarterback takes. Uh, I, I think if there's a guy that's sneaking in the first round of this mock, really, I think it's going to be Leonard or Fafita here uh, at uh, Arizona. After that, I'd probably say Ewers, Ewers, then Milrow, Aller. I'm just not really seeing it with Aller right now. Anybody else? Ollie Gordon's a really nice player. I mean, terrible offensive line at Oklahoma State. He, he really maximized that, that offense a ton. Mitchell Evans, like I said, definitely could be a first rounder. He just needs to stay healthy. Um, Emory Jones definitely could be in that first round mix. Um, Tess Johnson's a fun name. Barrett Carter, if you're familiar with the draft cycle from last year. High-end linebacker, high-end athlete, ton of coverage ability. I, I don't mind him. Could be an interesting blitzer, too. Anybody else? Trevion Henderson, like I said, former uh, top uh, running back recruit, former former for top overall recruit coming out of Virginia, I believe. Um, anybody else we want to talk about here? Pa uh, Patrick Payton could be an interesting edge guy. Get in the mix. Rod Moore's a rock solid safety, but I kind of see him as a second round. And yeah, that's that's about that's enough names for the way too early mock. The last pick here in this way too early 2025 mock draft, like I said, is Isaiah Bond. He just transferred to Texas, and with all those guys being drafted last year, it looks like Isaiah Bond. It's it's his world at Texas, and he's gonna be the number one uh, guy. A little bit small. All right, like 5'11", uh, but I think a ton of play strength. A couple of huge games last year for uh, Alabama. So depending on what Texas asks him to do, I could, this could be another breakout season for him. Um, and 
get the chance to be the number one, like clear cut number one leading volume guy in that offense. And it could lead to him being a first rounder. And obviously Kansas City is just, you know, it's fun to talk about receivers going to KC. But guys, let me know what you think about the way too early 2025 NFL draft. We not only talked about these 32 names, but we got in another six to eight guys that uh, weren't in this mock and kind of give you an, uh, an early look at that. But let me know what you think about this 2025 class as we are in the way too early stages. Who are some of your early favorite prospects? Who's your favorite team? Did you like the pick I gave your squad? Uh, and of course, let me know what you're thinking about this 2025 class a year in advance and specifically the quarterback class i'd love to know people's thoughts like who's your top guy right now i'd be really curious to see where the consensus is at right now so leave you those thoughts down below in the comment section i hope you guys enjoyed hit that like button if you did subscribe if you're new to the channel and see more football content and a lot of draft content on the way but i hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and until next time my name is teach i am signing off <laughs>